Problem sorted. Problem sorted. Hey, everyone. How are we doing? Doing good? Are you excited for summer? How many of you are officially done with school? Raise your hand. Nice. How many of you are still going for at least another couple days? Oh. I will pray for all of you. <laughs> hey. Say it every week, welcome back. Welcome back to the best night of the year. But the sad part about this week is that it is the last best night of the year. But we'll be back, right? We'll be back next year. In fact, the next time that we'll like all be together, not including those summer nights that we're going to be doing with Jacob and Laura, uh, is going to be Colorado. And so here's what I'll say, right? Here's what I'll say. If you've been hearing about Colorado over the past couple weeks and you really, 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 really want to come, whether you're a student or a leader, let us know. We have wait lists. We can bring more. We have a couple more spots for leaders. I think like two more or something like that. that two more. I was right. Praise God. Um, but we would love to have you come. And I guarantee you spots will open up for students. And so if you want to come, you should definitely get on that wait list. And shh. I know that, it, like, at least me and the team are really, really, really sad that it's the, the last night of the year and that it's coming to a close. And, and personally, I think it's, it's like a mixture of different emotions, right? It's getting really warm outside. That's a good thing. The waters are warming up. We Minnesota people love our lakes. That's a good thing, right? The grass is getting greener. The trees are blooming. These are all good things that make us happier, especially after a really, really long and cold winter. How many of you feel like this winter was one of the longest, coldest winters you've ever experienced, right? No, oh, it literally felt terrible. Now, hold on, hold on. I'm going to test the theory. Shh, shh. Adults, leaders, how many of you felt like it was one of the longest, coldest winters ever? Okay, more, more. It was cold, but we, hadn't, we literally had the coldest winter in Minnesota history two years ago, and I kind of forgot about that one this year. But other than that, but then there's also the sadness of this school year ending, our seniors leaving, some of our leaders who have been leading seniors stepping out for a much-needed break, hopefully coming back in a couple of years. We'll see. And so while we're excited for the warmth and the completion of another school year, we're also sad because of what it means for us, but we are not done yet. One more message. We have one more song at the end of this and one more time with our small groups to wrap up the, the night. And so I just want to say in the midst of this intimate space, let's agree together that we're not going to waste this evening. That, that we're going to lean in closer than we have all school year and that we're really going to encounter Jesus one last time for this year at next high school inside of this building. And so before we dive in, let me, let me pray for us. Jesus, we love you. God, we love you so much, and we run to you right now. Lord, on behalf of all of Next High School, I just, I, I just want to run into your presence with these students. Lord, believing that you have one last word for us this school year, believing that you are not done with at least one student in this room, God, that there's at least one person that needs to hear your words tonight. Lord, and that every student in this room would be encouraged by the reading of your word, as always. And so, Jesus, be with us. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest for a second. I am in this fairly annoying and potentially unhealthy habit with my wife. A and if you're married, you, you probably, at least one of you, can relate to this. A and I'm just, I'm just going to be honest here for a second, right? Now, here, here's what it is. Every now and then, shh, listen up, listen up. Shh, every now and then, she'll get this look on her face, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, she's mad about something. And so what do I naturally do? I look her in the eye, and I say, hey, are you mad? And she almost always answers with a very quick and succinct answer that is true and straight to the point. Nope. And the unhealthy habit is that for some reason, my small male brain is unable to believe that her answer is true, right? And so I'll ask her, I will quite literally, I'll say to her, my dear, lovely 
wonderful, beautiful, intelligent, delightful, sweet wife, hath something upset thou. (laughs) And she will look me deep in the eyes. Nope. And then I'll look at her again. And I'll say, are you sure? She's like, yep. And then you think, Matt, stop. Don't go further than that. And I'll go, you're lying, aren't you? And she goes, no. And I'm like, Jay. And she goes, now I'm mad. And that's the cycle that I follow and I fall into it more often than I care to admit. Now, is that a mistake and something potentially unhealthy on my part? Could be, maybe. But the point is this. For some reason, within my own mind, I think that I know the truth about how she is feeling better than she knows the truth about how she is feeling. And fun fact, I'm wrong 100% of the time. Because I am not her, and I am not God, and I do not have the ability to see inside of her mind and inside of her heart and see something that she herself cannot see. And and the reason why I bring up that story is simply to say that Jesus is the only one who knows the in and outs of our emotions, our psyche, and how we are feeling. He is the only one who knows us better than we actually know ourselves. And when I practice that, I am functionally saying to my wife, hey, I know you better than you know you, and that just isn't true because I am not God. And and we see this especially in the final chapter of the book of John when Jesus reveals himself to his friends for the third time since being risen from the dead after his crucifixion and a crucifixion that brought into this world forgiveness of sins for all who would believe in Jesus Christ. And If you have your Bible or you have your phones, you can open up to John chapter 21 with me. It will not be on the screens for you. John chapter 21 going all the way to verse, uh, I think, 19, I think. Let's find out, actually. I'll tell you right now. It doesn't really matter, but we'll see. Uh, All the way to verse 17. And so as we are reading, I want you to pay attention to a single word that we're going to see repeated a lot of times in this text. And that's simply the word love. We're going to see the word love repeat, and then we're going to come back to that and dig a little bit deeper into it. So again, starting verse 1 in chapter 21 of John. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon, Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing, 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 wow, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you, and they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Verse 5, Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. Pause. Do you recognize this story? Jesus' first miracle with his disciples was also his last. It's as if Jesus is saying to them, hey, do you remember who I am? This is sort of my signature move, right? I tell you to, like, Jesus probably thinking himself, like, I tell you to go to the net on the other side, like, you should know it's me by now, but they still don't recognize that it is him. Verse 7, that disciple whom Jesus loved, John, the author, <laughs> therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon P- Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far off from the land, but about 100 yards off. So Peter's like, I want to go see Jesus. The other people are like, there's so much money in these nets. We've got to keep that before we go see Jesus. Verse 9, when they got, out, got out, out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. 
Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And so Jesus, the risen Savior, went to his friends, and he ate perhaps one of the most supernatural breakfasts that has ever existed in mankind. Right? He says to them, hey, bring me some fish, even though he's already got fish roasting on a charcoal fire. He conjures out of nothing bread, and he serves them breakfast. Almost as if he's saying, like, hey, I never left. I've been here the whole time. And yet this was the man that they had just recently seen crucified and has literally been popping up in random places, right? There's a story where the door is locked and, oh, out of nowhere, Jesus shows up. So they're fishing, and oh, out of nowhere, Jesus shows up once more. And the next couple of verses are where I want to sit for the evening. The heading is Jesus and Peter. It says this in verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter responded to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him again, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep sheep. Tonight's message is going to be simple. And whether you are one year into high school, two years, three years, or four years and finishing up your senior year as we speak, I want to ask you a very simple question tonight. Do you love Jesus? Do you, fill in your name, love Jesus? Jesus. You see, the the reason for this potentially strange and seemingly unnecessary and confusing, perhaps, interaction and encounter between Simon Peter, so Peter the Apostle, and Jesus is found in the hours before Jesus' crucifixion. It says this in John chapter 13, verses 36 through 38. Simon Peter said to Jesus, Lord, where are you going? This is before Jesus was crucified. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, The rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. You see, Jesus, in his divine ability to know the future and everything that will come to pass, was already aware of Peter's pending betrayal before it happened. He knew before he even met Peter in the flesh for the very first time that Peter would one day betray him three times. And so we see on three different occasions, Peter denies that he was a follower of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 18, it says, starting in verse 15, Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. This is while Jesus was being put on trial to be crucified. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you are not one of this man's disciples, are you? Are you one of those followers of Jesus? And Peter says to him, I am not. Verse 25, now Simon Peter was standing And warming himself. So they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it a second time. 
And then afterwards, one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had just cut off in the garden of Gethsemane before Jesus was arrested, said to Peter, did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter again denied it. And at once the rooster crowed. See, in Jesus' divine knowledge, rightly saw what was inside Peter's heart and knew it before it even happened. He knew that when push came to shove, Jesus would den- or Peter would deny Jesus to protect his own safety. And, and in today's world, such a betrayal would be matched with a great punishment, but not so with our Jesus. You see, the story we read that took place on the beach after a breakfast made by the risen Savior is not just a meaningless line of questioning. It is literally salvation in play. It is forgiveness in front of our eyes. And it's like the whole of Scripture, a magnifying glass over the goodness, the love, the grace, and the mercy of God, of our Savior named Jesus. And so if we read it one more time, starting in verse 15, it says this, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter responded to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus responded back to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he responded back, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. For three rejections, there were three opportunities for him to proclaim his love for Christ and receive Christ's love in return. See, he rejected Christ three times, and in Christ gave him three opportunities to essentially say to him, Lord, I love you. I love you, God. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I need you. And in much of Scripture, we see that there is what I like to call the obvious truth of the text. Sitting right there in front of our eyes is the obvious implication, the obvious application, and the obvious observations, right? The things where you read it and just immediately you're like, okay, I see that. Almost like in this story. Like we know Jesus denied or Peter denied Jesus three times, and so Jesus asking him, do you love me three times? Like it seems to be pretty obvious that Jesus is almost reinstating Peter, that we're seeing Jesus forgive Peter in front of our eyes. But when you dig beneath the text there is yet more to be discovered. And that's the case with what we just read. So you may not know this, but the Bible was originally written, or at least the New Testament was originally written in ancient Greek, a language that is no longer spoken. And you can study and learn how to read it, but people don't really write in it anymore. It's ancient for a reason, right? It's a dead language. Now, in the ancient Greek... There are different ways to communicate love, very different than the way that we do so in our modern English. When we, cr- or when we communicate that we love something, we use the word love. And if we want to change the type of love, we simply add an adverb to it. And boom, it's a different type of love. So, for instance, uh, the difference between love and passionate love right? Love and selfish love, love and unconditional love, love and conditional love. If we want to change the type of love we're talking about, we just add an adverb in front of it to change the type of love. In Greek, they had four different words for four different types of love. And I want to talk about two of them, but I'm going to tell you what they all are. The first one's known as storgy. This love is most often used to describe the affection between you and another thing or person. C.S. Lewis says that this type of love is how we feel about an old t-shirt, a pair of slippers, or my favorite, he says this, the sound of your dog's tail thumping on the kitchen floor. So this in our culture, when we talk about how we overuse the word love, like I love The Bachelor, but not as much as I love The Bachelorette, right? or I love whatever it might be, or I love this, or I love that, or I love this person, or I love that person, or I love this teacher, or I love that teacher, whatever it might be, we overuse this type of love. But in ancient Greek culture, it was the rarest form of love, which I think is interesting. The other one is eros love. 
This love is used to describe intimate passion, which is mostly sexual. And so Plato, however, defined eros love this way. He says, although eros is initially felt for a person, with contemplation, it becomes an appreciation of the beauty within that person or even becomes appreciation of beauty itself. It is the form of love that is most often used to communicate intimate love, and it's still used today. The two types of love I really want to talk about tonight are philia and agape. Philia love is the love to describe affectionate regard and friendship. Right? We might call this brotherly love. It's, it's sort of described as being dispassionate and virtuous, right? It's conditional. You can earn philia love, but you can also lose it. If you betray a friend who once loved you, they may cease to philia love you because you betrayed them. It's often communicated as loyalty to friends, loyalty to family, loyalty to community. And in contrast, there's agape love. This is a love that we're probably all most familiar with within the church. This is perfect love. It's unconditional love. It's unblemished and unwavering love. Thomas Aquinas, an ancient theologian, descri- dis- described, it, described it this way. To will the good of another. C.S. Lewis describes Agape love is the divine energy from which God sustains all thing, all things. And so knowing this, I want to go back and place a magnifying glass over the scripture that we just read. Because when you read it in Greek, there's two different types of love. It goes like this. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, Do you agape me more than these? Do you unconditionally love me more than these? Peter responds, Yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. He said to him, tend my sheep. This interaction is spectacular. See, yes, it serves as a sort of reinstatement of Peter after his denial of Jesus. Almost as if with each ask, Jesus is, Jesus is forgiving him of each denial. But it also shows us two significant details that I want you to walk away with tonight. The first one is the love that Jesus deserves. And the second one is the love that we can give. See, I think when we read this initially, or at least how I initially read this, I I read it through a lens and with a voice of optimism and and triumph, right? It's almost as if Jesus is asking Peter if he loves him, and Peter is proudly pronouncing, yes, yes. Like, I denied you three times, but Jesus, now that you died for me, like, now I really love you. And we read it, and we're like, Jesus is reinstating Peter. They're best friends again. The conflict's revolved. All is Gucci. He's the rock on which he's going to build his church. All things are good. But the more that I have studied this passage, the more I think it's actually the opposite. I think it's discouraging for Peter initially. Jesus asks him, do you perfectly and unconditionally love me? To which Peter, with his three denials still ripe in his mind, can only answer, I can imperfectly and conditionally love you, Lord. Peter, do you agape me? Lord, I phileo you. Likely with his head hanging and the taste of tears on his tongue, Jesus asks him once more, Simon, son of John, do you perfectly love me? Can you provide for me the love which I deserve and the love which I give you? Lord, you know I phileo you. Lord, I conditionally love you. I picture this interaction almost as a standoff between the two. Not one of aggression or anger or violence, but one of longing, 
of deep intimacy between two friends, between God and his creation, where Jesus is proclaiming to all of us, I deserve agape. And which we proclaim to him, we can give phileo. What do I mean? Friends, if you haven't experienced this already, there will be a day when you choose something else over Jesus. You choose the satisfaction of something else over the satisfaction of Christ. Just like Peter chose the safety of denial over the safety of Christ. But Jesus deserves agape. But Jesus also knows what it's like to be human. Though he is the embodiment of agape, knowing that he is the embodiment of agape, knowing that he deserves unconditional love, he still receives all that we can give. See, all scripture is beautiful and should propel us into deeper love with Jesus and greater worship of him. But what we are going to read next should send us to our knees because of the reality of Christ that it reveals to us. See, Jesus, having asked Peter if he can agape him twice and having heard from Peter with two subsequent answers, no, but I can phileo, says to Peter for the third and final time, he switches. He says, Peter, can you phileo me? Peter, can you agape me? Lord, I can phileo you. Peter, can you agape me? Lord, I can phileo you. Peter, can you phileo me? And it says that Peter is grieved. He says, Lord, you know my heart. You know everything. You know that I phileo you. Jesus met Peter right where he was. Jesus knew that he deserves agape. Right, I don't want you to take this as me saying that Jesus isn't deserving of our agape because this scripture makes it evident that he is. But when we can't agape him, he will receive our phileo. See, the beauty of this text isn't just that Jesus forgives Peter for denying him. The beauty of this text is that Jesus receives from Peter what Peter is able to give. And so I said that there were two main takeaways from this passage when we dig deep dig deep beneath the surface. And the first is that Peter, or that Jesus deserves agape. The second is that we can't love God the way that God demands to be loved, and yet he allows us to love him imperfectly anyways. Friends, if you're in this room tonight and you're thinking that you can't be a part of God's people because you can't seem to love him the way they or those Christians do, Like you think to yourself, there's no way you can love God that passionately because you're mad at him because of your mom's cancer or your parents' divorce or your mental illness or the way you look or the way you sound, whatever it might be. Let me tell you something. None of us can love God the way God deserves to be loved. But God, in his mercy and grace, will take all that we can give even though he knows just how much he deserves. Even though he knows just how much we can't give. You see, in order for God to be the divine embodiment of agape, then God himself must be the divine embodiment of unconditional love. And so he gives us a choice. Will you receive his unconditional love? Because the condition that has been required to receive that love has been met by Christ when he died on the cross for you and for me. So God says to all of humankind, believe in me and you shall inherit eternal life. Do you want unconditional love? If you do, then believe in the one who can give it. Believe knowing that God will receive all that you could give, just like he did with Peter. And and lastly, I'll say this. Maybe you're a Christian in this room, and you're going through what we might call a rough patch in the faith. Maybe you feel like Peter felt, having just denied Jesus three times further away from him than you've ever been, and less sure of yourself or your salvation than you have ever been. Doubts are flooding your mind, and you are truly wondering, is this it? 
I said earlier that Peter chose to deny Jesus in order to stay safe from the punishments of being a disciple while Christ was being crucified. But what's ironic is Peter's denial of Christ didn't stop Christ from calling him. The section that we read ends in verse 18 and 19 with this. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk around wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death Peter was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Little Bible reading tip for you. Whenever you see truly, truly, it means this statement is extra true. In the ancient Greek, when it, rep- when it was repeated, truly, truly, it was like a lecturer saying, okay, you have to take notes on this. When your teacher says to you, hey, you must write this down, it's going to be on the test. Jesus is saying this is important. Peter denied Jesus to secure his safety, but that didn't change what God was going to call Peter to do and who Peter would be. So you may not know this, but church history tells us that Peter is considered to be the first pastor figure after Christ ascended. He'd be the one to deliver the sermon which led many to Christ on the day of Pentecost. But not only that, church history tells us that Peter was crucified just like Jesus. The only difference is a strange one. Peter requested before his martyrdom that he would be crucified upside down because he didn't think himself worthy to be killed the same way Christ was killed. See, despite Peter's attempts at safety and denial of Christ, God still called Peter to do great things in his name and for his church. And so, friend, whoever you are, whatever season you find yourself in, know that God can and will still use you powerfully for his church. And oftentimes, he'll use you in the very ways you are most afraid to be used. So trust in him. Know that he is the embodiment of agape, and no condition can remove the love that God has for you. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Even though we were or are rebels against God, his son still died for us. He is the divine embodiment of agape. A love that is unconditional, that is available to you and to me. So Jesus, we receive that love, Lord, if we believe. If the one repeating these words, if the one listening to me right now is one who believes in you, Jesus, then I pray that again they would come to a realization of your great love for them. But God, if they've never met you before, if this is the first time they're hearing about this great love, I just pray that you would just cover them with your agape love. God, we love you. We need you. And Lord, in this last song, would we sing these words, give me Jesus, Lord. You can have all that we are. You can have all of our sin. You can have everything we've ever done, Lord, because you know all of it. We can hide nothing from you. Lord, here we are. Send us. We praise you in your name. Amen.